James Turk. I'm a director of the Gold Money Foundation. I'm very pleased to be participating in this monetary summit sponsored by Casey Research and Sprott Asset Management. The summit is entitled When Money Dies, which is the name of a book by Adam Ferguson, uh, When Money Dies, The Nightmare of Deficit Spending, Devaluation, and Hyperinflation in Weimar, Germany. It's my pleasure to be here today with the author, Adam Ferguson, noted historian, former member of par the European Parliament, and author of five books. So, Adam, thank you for participating in this interview. I'm very sorry not to be at the conference in person, but I'm very happy to be talking to you. So, Adam, in your book, it is clear that the underlying cause of great hyperinflation was that at the time central bankers and government officials didn't connect the dots between money printing and inflation. In the current crisis with the quantitative easings and competitive currency devaluation, do you think central bankers are at risk of making the same mistake? Central bankers, without exception, all understand monetary theory. Um, the fact that they ignore what they know is for political or economic or other purposes is beside the point. They know what causes inflation, they know what causes devaluation and depreciation of the currency. Sometimes it is seen to be politically necessary, politically necessary, uh, to do what everything, all common sense tells you should not be done. And since 2007, the spending of the United States on wars and social programs seems to have broken free of the realities um, of finance. Do you see the parallels? I think that's stretching it quite a long way. In Germany in 1914, uh, hoped to win a quick war. They hoped it would be over by Christmas and that they would be able to pay for it by the uh, by what they seized from the Allied um, treasuries when they'd won it. Um, this is not the same kind of uh, uh, condition at all. The wars that uh, the West, America, NATO has been fighting have all been for uh, very different purposes with very different objectives than from what uh, Germany was seeking in those, uh, in those days. And the financing of the war, well, the Germans simply didn't bother to think out how that war should be financed. They didn't think it would arise. But aren't there, isn't that a parallel with the present situation? Are governments today really thinking of the consequences of the deficit spending that they're pursuing to finance wars and social programs? I suppose that's, uh, you, you could certainly argue it, but uh, national defense is often thought to be the most important thing for many people. And whether you think a war here or there across the world is in the national defense is another matter. But uh, national defense is something that, that from throughout history, people have always put right at the top of the, uh, the national necessities. When you wrote Money uh, Dies in 1975, um, the world was in the grip of inflation um, at double digits or approaching double digits. Yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah. Do you see a similar um, occurrence of inflation? Um, do you see inflation occurring again in the future as a consequence of the policies that are being pursued? Oh, yes, I do. I see it, it, I see it getting worse and worse. The question is how bad it's going to be. If you're looking again back on Germany, I don't think it's possible to have uh, in, a, in a, an advanced Western economy uh, hyperinflation of the kind that was uh, achieved there uh, through mainly through monetary ignorance. Uh, but it, inflation, if you start inflating your economy, you're, you're playing with fire always, and it can get out of hand. And to that extent, um, the parallel again is, is certainly there. Do you sense that inflation is starting to get out of hand given all of the quantitative easing that central banks around the world are pursuing uh, to finance these um, seemingly never-ending never government deficits? I think the, ser the position is, of course, terribly serious right through, again, the Western economies. I don't see that any of these economies is going to be able to grow its way out of the extraordinary debts that they have. The logic of that, if you can't uh, grow your way out of your debt, um, you have to repudiate that debt. And there's only one serious way of repudiating debt, and that's by inflating. That's what, it's what a government can do, and possibly what the only thing it can do eventually, if those debts have to be met, you just get rid of them. You know, going back to the Weimar Republic um, infl hyperinflation in Germany, um, what I'd like to do is, you know, again, just sort of emphasize what we can learn from history. 
Um, you know, I'm a firm believer in the dictum of the American philosopher George Santayana that if we ignore history, we're doomed to relive it. And I think the period of the hyperinflation is definitely um, an area that we want to avoid. Um, but looking back uh, at that Weimar experience, who were the people who benefited from that inflation? Government obviously benefited because they repaid their debts for next to nothing. Well, not only government, but if you, were, if you had a mortgage, your mortgage was paid off because you could pay it off in postage stamps. Um, if you were a speculator, you could borrow, uh, borrow cheaply. The, the Rice Bank um, was prepared to give almost limitless credit to anybody who wanted to um, set up a factory or export or anything like that because there was such fear of unemployment uh, that's another parallel today, um, in, 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 the, in the nation as a whole, when, at a time when revolution was, of course, in the air, they couldn't stand the idea of mass unemployment, and so they gave endless credit, and the answer was that anyone who got hold of their credit it, uh, could export cheaply, uh, using cheap labor at home, because the price of labor was coming down all the time, and so you got profiteering and speculation on a very, very big scale. The effect of that was to, um, was to bring a lot of foreign exchange into the country. And the people who used that were, again, the industrialists and profiteers who were uh, building up their empires all the time. The people who were losing, naturally, were the, um, the, the people who depended on um, uh, shares and bonds and everything else. Anyone who'd saved any money, all that money disappeared. The other people who um, did well, it's an extraordinary thing how, and you, I think you can see it again now, uh, inflation develops its own uh, lobby, supporting lobby. There are people who, uh, as in Germany, people uh, uh, try to persuade the government to go on, um, to go on inflating, to go on printing money because they were making so much out of it. Nowadays, um, people who benefit are the... I don't know, the hedge fund managers, all the people across the world who are making a lot of money out of the, um, the wild fluctuations in the value of, of, the, uh, of uh, currencies all, uh, all across the world. These are people who, who, who benefit. So the creditors benefited and the savers and people who had financial assets denominated in Reichsmarks, which was the currency at the time, uh, they were the they were the losers. They were losing all the time. Anybody who had a fixed income, a pensioner, uh, they would lose. The only people who gained, who no, no, that's the wrong word. The people who were able to keep up with inflation for a long time was anybody who had any kind of grip uh, on on the on the public finances. That is to say, if you were in a trade union, you could strike for higher wages. Uh, uh, let's say a public trade union. Uh, if you were in the railways and the post office, that sort of thing, you could strike and the government would simply print more money. You could keep up. But if you were a pensioner or someone like a, a professor or an architect or a lawyer who, uh, who couldn't, who, who was, the demand for whose services was not very high when, in times of high inflation, uh, your income would simply disappear and you would, instead of making money out of other people, you would find yourself breaking rocks beside the on the riverside. How did the German banks fare in the hyperinflation? Were they winners or losers? The German banks, I think they came out of it. I mean, they still existed afterwards. The German banking system was highly complicated. It was then, and I think still is, because there were, all, there were so many state banks and landers banks and so on. And they were, many of them were issuing their own currency as well while the central bank was issuing these huge amounts of money and getting with bigger and bigger denominations, uh, there was never enough to go around. And local banks, just as local companies, uh, were issuing um, money as well. Um, when I would, it's a good question. I'm not quite cert certain what the, the answer is, but they survived. Um, I think bankers always, always survive, and that's one of the sinister things about some bankers. They knew what the monetary mm -hmm. problems were and therefore yeah. were able to position themselves to take yeah. advantage mm -hmm. of it. Equally, some, as we know now, yeah. <laughs> as still happens, go, go spectacularly bust. But that's, again... Absent the inflation, do you see any way that governments today can repay their huge debt loads? I personally can't. Um, 
uh, we are talking about a selected, selected number of governments. Um, Germany will be all right. America, I think, will not. Uh, these southern, these Mediterranean countries, I think, will not. And I don't see really inflation as being, uh, as there being any other obvious way out. Um, it is interesting the way uh, the expression of what keeps on mute people are going, kicking the can down the road and, and not facing the, uh, the facts. And indeed, one goes on hoping that there will be some kind of solution will come out of the, will be found in the back of the cupboard, but there's no sign of it. And the, the, in, in, in European terms, the thought is always that first you can try issuing uh, central bank bonds, which will be backed by everybody, but the Germans won't have it. The other possibility is that Europe becomes much closer um, fiscally so that it, is, it works as one great um, United States of Europe. Um, people don't want that. It may be the only way out. Uh, but if they, and if they won't have it, and it, I think even that would only be a, a reach-me-down kind of solution because Germany will end up by carrying whatever can has to be car carried, um, eventually inflation will be the answer. It may be quite a good answer. I mean, one or two countries will default, but um, thereafter, um, stability, as in Germany again, will be uh, attained eventually by a default and starting again. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the implications of the hyperinflation and, uh, you know, as individuals, what you can do about it to, to protect yourself. Um, in 1991, I traveled down to Argentina because um, my sense of it was that the Austral, which was the currency at the time, was about to hyperinflate. Yep. Um, they had broke the link to the U.S. dollar, uh, 14 Australs to one U.S. dollar in January of 1991. Uh, I arrived in early May, and the devaluation had already been quite severe. There were 64 uh, Australs to one U.S. dollar. Uh, when I left um, a week later, it had gone up to 96 Australs, uh, and by December it was 10,000 Australs to one U.S. dollar. And, you know, I remember very vividly, you know, talking to shopkeepers, particularly um, the concern, because they had gone through hyperinflation before and knew what they needed to do to protect themselves, but were obviously very, very worried about what they saw coming. I'd like to talk though a little bit about hyperinflation and, you know, um, in Germany and, you know, what were the social consequences of that hyperinflation? Um, they were horrendous, I would say. Um, you had a whole class of people, the rentier classes, the people who had savings, they were ruined. You had the professional classes um, unable to make any money at all. We're talking about, about over three years. Um, you had the, the outbreak of um, of crime, of corruption, and Germany had n never been a corrupt country before. Um, you had uh, political um, riots all over the place, food riots, um, employment riots, unemployment riots. Uh, you had Hitler down in Bavaria um, stirring people up, saying that everything is the fault of the Jews. and. So you, there was a total social breakdown. Um, you also had the uh, effect of seeing people swarming in from outside, after all the war was over for three years, spending their money, uh, spending foreign exchange, and being able to buy all kinds of things from everybody. You were reduced eventually to a barter economy, so that unless you had foreign exchange, um, you, you, you couldn't even buy food. Um, country was divided against town because in the countryside there was still lots of food, but they wouldn't sell the food to the to the towns because they wouldn't didn't want worthless paper in return. Uh, so you had class against class. You had people, your friends. You you always suspected your friends were doing rather better than you were at, at any time, and you were suspicious of, of people who appeared to be uh, able to work the system. Um, Everybody was gambling on it. Who could, who had any money, gambled on the stock exchange, um, because all the time uh, people were thinking of the price of the dollar. Everything was dollars. Uh, well, they talked about dollars, but they, the dollar was still tied to gold, of course. So really, that was certainly. a substitute for gold. Uh, that's fair enough. But I mean, the, the point, the point about that, everyone thought the dollar was um, going up all the time. 
but in fact it was the uh, sorry that the, 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 that the mark was going up against the dollar. Oh my God, it's, it's now at a million, it's now at two million, it's now a thousand million, and so on. But in fact, it was the uh, it looked as if the mark was going up, but in fact the mark was going down. The dollar was very largely re uh, retaining its um, uh, retaining its, its value. Yeah. As you say, it was uh, in gold, and, and um, the gold the uh, the Germans had a, a very strange approach to all this. They they always said a, mark, a gold mark equals a mark, and even the uh, the um, president of the Rice Bank, Dr. Havenstein, spoke of things getting back to normal, where he thought the mark would once again be worth a gold mark. They never they never sort of lost this idea, and, to, and in, in fact, at the very very end of the of the inflation, when the old mark disappeared and they brought in the Brenton mark, um, when the old mark was worth a million million. Um, uh, a million millionth of what it formerly was, um, they re achieved the idea that a mark equal to a mark by simply by knocking off um, 12 zeros from the uh, from the, de the mark denominated in that way. Um, so that they ha hung on to gold right to the end as being what uh, what mattered. And indeed all the reparations paid by Germany um, to, to the Allies, especially to the French and the Germans, reparations for the war, they had to be paid in gold marks or, or in, in uh, materials worth uh, uh, with a gold mark value. So gold remained at all times in Germany the measure of, uh, of, of, of what was important to them. The numeraire for standard of value. Yeah. When I was in Argentina in 1991, I only stayed in the city. I didn't go to the countryside, but I got a sense from talking to people in the city that people in the country were much better off. Was that true in Germany? Yes. Uh, and, and in fact, they were better off because uh, a lot of people in the country held mortgages which had been eliminated by, uh, by the collapse of the value of the mark. Uh, they could pay off their mortgages to, uh, in, as I say, in, in postage stamps. Um, the, it, the, the real trouble was uh, being a creditor. Um, you know, remember the Polonius's advice to Ophelia in Hamlet: "Never a borrower, nor a lender be." But he could have added, in inflation, if we we're going to be a borrower or lender, for God's sake, be a borrower, because uh, the more you borrowed, um, the less you had to pay back. And that, of course, is true. I mean. If a uh, central bank has a 2% inflation target, well, that's 2% of robbery. I mean, it, it, you know, anyone who has, has money, whether it's, it's the Chinese or uh, the, the, the saver living in her flat at the, the, top, the top of some building in wherever, um, they are being robbed all the time. And uh, unless you have some kind of... Uh, Specie or share, which is going to is index thing, is going to keep its value, and they didn't have that sort of thing in Germany at the time. You're being the, your debt, the debts that you have are being repudiated. Was there any attempt um, after the hyperinflation that contracts that were paid at you know pennies uh, pennies on the uh, on the mark uh, after the hyperinflation? You know, to rewrite those contracts so that they had to be repaid in a sound currency. Uh, no, there was some of the some of the government bonds were repaid at sort of four or five percent. I mean, not a hundred percent. There was a certain amount of that, uh, and bec simply because in the course of the hyperinflation, or rather the the pre-hyperinflation times, uh, 19, 21, 22, when it took off, um, they began to. Um, issue bonds and uh, various instruments which were guaranteed in some sort of way against the future. But uh, the guarantees weren't bit worth very much. Uh, the answer is no. Broadly speaking, no, I think. The reason why I'm asking that question is I don't want to give viewers of this video the impression that you know, borrowing during a period of inflation is a one-way street. Because um, I like to use the example of uh, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, um, he paid the debts on his uh, father-in-law's estate 
um, just shortly before the uh, War uh, of Independence broke mm -hmm. out, and it placed the currency with the state government during the period of war uh, in Virginia um, with the money to be then paid after mm -hmm. the war. But while the money was sitting there, um, it, it basically was debased to nothing. Uh, and after the war, uh, the courts ruled that he had to repay that debt again in hard currency, um, which, you know, of course, was the British pound. Mm -hmm. So he ended up having to pay that debt twice. There, there was no effort like that in Germany to force creditors to repay in terms of uh, what they actually borrowed. No, the, all the pressure really was coming from the Allies, from France, the Reparations Com Commission. Um, the winners, I told you, were the speculators, the industrialists who were building, who got endless credit, built factories, um, were able to export using um, low wages at home, and uh, making a, a huge amount of money in in foreign exchange. Um, so that, uh, and, they, and they were for a time the winners. When the inflation was over, uh, they found themselves unable to uh, to cope with the. Uh, the, uh, all these em empty factories, uh, which which nobody wanted to use, because the economy had been destroyed by it the hyperinflation. It had been totally destroyed. Yeah. It, it, it's, it was astonishing how quickly, after the final default, after everyone was ruined, after the um, after the money had died, after the mark was worthless, how quickly uh, it was possible to uh, to build the economy again from base. Uh, uh, many people had been ruined, and they had to start again as well. And it was helped by the Dawes Plan, which rather like the Marshall Plan uh, after the Second World War, um, the Amer America uh, came to uh, Germany's rescue. And it again, uh, Germany had to, had to default on a lot of the its reparations um, obligations. It simply couldn't afford to pay. Incidentally, interestingly, the. Um, German reparations for the First World War were finally paid last April. Uh, Hitler suspended um, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, the payment of, of the reparation obligations. Um, when, uh, after the war, it was decided that the reparations payments would not continue until Germany was united, reunited. When it was reunited, they started again, and that's why they, they finally been paid off. But that's a yeah, just historical, historical fact. Uh, uh, footnote. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, you know, again, in terms of having people protect themselves, we talked about foreign exchange, which obviously you know meant gold, um, tangible assets. Uh, was that another way that they were able to protect oh, yeah, themselves? I mean, this business of havens, which we see so much nowadays, um, was very much in vogue. First, you tried to get foreign currency. Um, and the best ones to hold were, were the Swiss franc, the guilder, the two neutrals, and dollars, and to some extent sterling. So you went for those if you could. Failing that, you got rid of your money. This is by talking about 1923 when inflation was becoming so extraordinary. Um, you simply got, uh, took your money, bought a share if you could, because the stock exchange was still working very well, um, or you converted it into a grand piano, or whatever, whatever you could persuade anyone else who's desperate for money uh, to part with. Um, and you're always looking for that. Um, uh, there was a problem with housing. The Germans have never wanted to own houses very much. They've always tended to rent them. Um, and the, the land, landowners and landlords were in a very bad way because the, there had been a law had been passed early in the war controlling rents. Um, holding at pre-war value, uh, value. So if you had, a, if you happened to have an apartment um, uh, and you you rented it, uh, you could do. You went on doing that extremely cheaply. But in the, in the meantime, your landlord or landlady was in penury. Hmm. So visible wealth was hmm. visible tangible yeah. assets were not necessary. I mean, it was quite a good thing to to, to own a block a block of apartments, but. Um, it wasn't doing much good until, uh, until much later on when you could set it again. Yeah. Can you discuss a little bit what ultimately brought the hyperinflation to an end? Yes. When the mark, by September 1923, when the mark, I think, was worth, when the dollar, I should say, was worth about 100 million marks, um, no one was taking it anymore. 
various attempts had been made to uh, produce, uh, to think of some new currency that people would accept. There was still just enough gold in Germany uh, to back a new currency, although that gold was spitting out all the time towards the allies in reparations. Uh, and eventually, um, when on the same day that Dr. Havenstein died in November uh, 1923, he was succeeded by Dr. Schacht, who eventually became Hitler's um, banker. Um, and he brought in uh, this new uh, um, note called the Rentenmark. Uh, the Reichsmark, the, the mark disappeared. The Rentenmark was brought in, and it was based not on gold, of which the, by that time wasn't really enough. It was based on the, based on the national value of land, um, which was, incidentally was the same as the assignat of the French Revolution um, in, 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 in the 1790s. Um, it meant nothing. People couldn't take a rent and mark and go and buy a bit of land with it. But because people were in such despair, they were prepared to believe in this new currency. Um, it was uh, the important thing about the, the Schacht reforms was that uh, the, uh, the Rice Bank stopped discounting uh, treasury notes. And so inflation stopped just like that with an astonishing speed. Um, and the rent mark, which went on for another, I don't know, I think it was about 12 months before the Rice Mark, uh, which was the new currency, could be brought in. So it went mark, rent and mark, Rice Mark after the Second World War, War it became the Deutsche Mark, but that's another story. Um, now, the effect of having the Renton Mark and, and a currency everyone believed in uh, was very remarkable. In the first place, because people believed in it and, and uh, the food started flowing into the, from the country into the town again, the, um, the farmers were prepared to accept the Renton Mark in exchange for the food. The problem in the towns was that nobody could afford, the, afford to pay for it because they they lost all their money. But at least this was a basis on which something could be could be done. Um, it had another effect uh, that all the revolutionary movements were moving around, that were taking place in Germany at the time, and Hitler's uh, uh, beer seller um, putsch, which had happened in in in, in early November. Um, this was just one one of the things that were, that, that were terrifying everybody. There had been revolution in Russia you see, um, a few years before. Um, and all these, with the introduction of the Renton Mark and the end of the Mark, all these um, political movements, left or right, uh, ceased to trouble. It was again an extraordinary thing. It was at that point then, uh, then something began to grow again. Uh, unemployment, unemployment again got much worse. But you know, within two years, uh, the Ger a German economy was being reconstructed and working. So if the central bank stopped discounting or monetizing government debt, there was a dramatic cutback in government spending then as well under the Renton mark? Some, a lot of the unemployment, of course, that broke out then was, uh, say, the railways being put in order. They, they were, as in Austria, they, about two or three times as many people as ought to be running the railways were running the railways. The post office again was had twice as much, uh, twice as many um, operatives as ought to be in there. This is the sort of thing that they were able to sort out, and that's why you got a lot of unemployment. On the other hand, um, people began uh, began to believe that Germany was worth trading with once again. Um, she escaped for the time, a lot of the reparations payment which had, uh, had ruined her. And um, things very slowly came back to normal. I repeat again, a lot of people were ruined. And uh, a lot of, um, and what is perhaps more terrible was that democracy had got a very bad name in Germany, which is one of the reasons why uh, 10 years later, um, it was possible for a demagogue to take over. Uh, but that was via the problems of the Great Depression and, and all that. But, uh, In your epilogue to the book, you say uh, to the German people, 
quote, democracy and republicanism have become so associated with financial, social, and political disorder as to render any alternatives preferable when disorder threatened again. So that helped. I think that puts it rather well. Yeah, that helped facilitate yes. the rise of Hitler. Yes. Because he promised order when there was none. Exactly. Is that the lesson of history? Uh, the lesson of history is never good. <laughs> Don't go there in the first place. Um, it's, this is a. I think I, I absolutely take. Uh, if you, you're saying what I is that what I'm saying is that if you debauch your currency, you're asking for trouble. I think I make the mark in the book again. I, I, I quote. I think it's Lenin uh, saying, "If you want to, the, the way to ruin the country is to ruin its country. Debau debauch the country and debauch its currency." Um, that, that's that, and uh, therefore every central bank, to my mind, and every central government uh, ought to regard the. Um, Keeping the, the, the value, of the um, uh, simply keep, keep keeping the currency something you can trust in. Yeah. It's the loss of trust that's so awful. But you say they should. The lesson of history is never to go there in the first place. But also in your epilogue, you say what really broke Germany. And this is a quote. What really broke Germany was the constant taking of the soft political option in respect of money. Well, that is what's going on now, isn't it? So is that the lesson from history? Yes, That certainly. we should prepare ourselves for perhaps a coming hyperinflation? Um, can it be stopped? Um, what, is, what is uh, hyperinflation, what is going to cause it? it causes, it's caused by the loss of trust by people in their money. Um, the cowardice of governments who don't say, right, this, this is stopping now. And then if people lose trust in their currency, then they start, start to get rid of it. It's interesting. They start by saving it when they start, uh, the first thing they, they they hold on to it, causing a depression. Then after a bit, they don't trust it. They get rid of it as fast as they, as they can, and then you get the, well, hundred dollars doing the work of ten dollars. I mean, uh, yeah. sorry, hundred dollars doing the work of a thousand dollars. Yeah, money is not just. And, a... and, that's, uh, and it, it, the velocity gets quicker and quicker, yes. and then governments lose control. At that point, you may you may find yourself moving into hyperinflation. Certainly very high inflation. Yeah, it's not just a function of supply, it's also a function of demand. And at, certain, sure. at a certain point, a tipping point, point will be reached where confidence is lost and people lose demand, uh, the demand for yep. that currency goes down and they spend it. That's right, but the, the, what is not clear is at what point do, does people's confidence in, uh, in their currency disappear? I mean, is it at a, at a inflation rate of 5%, 7%, 10%, 100%? Mm. Um, it, it's, it's not clear. In Germany, it's amazing how the, the confidence, belief in the mark, it went on right through the war and didn't really collapse and, until uh, it had reached, sort of, you've suddenly got 20% inflation, that sort of thing. But you, people are so unpredictable that... Um, well, you can't predict these things, but... But you the know, economy... All, all you economists try to predict things, and they do, <laughs> and they fail again and again and again. No one can predict the future in terms of the timing, but when you're on a road heading toward a cliff, eventually you're going to get to the end of that cliff. Yep. And that's not a prediction, it's just an inevitability. Inevitable, yep. but there's just one other thing in terms of the lessons of history that, you know, to wrap up. Um, also from your epi epilogue, you, you say, quote, there came a stage when it was politically impossible to halt inflation. Have we seen that? Also now in the West? Not quite, but we're getting near that situation. Uh, if, 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 if inflation is the only way out of government debt, um, as it is in the, in the Western nations, um, then it's going to happen. And the question is, how much? And once you don't even know how much, how are you going to stop it? Um, I don't want to predict hyperinflation. Um, I do predict high inflation, and I hope it can be stopped. And it may need the kind of courage that politicians cannot have. Um, Monsieur Juncker, who is the Luxembourg finance minister, or I don't know what he has now, he said something so wise. He said, we all know what has to be done. What we don't know is how to get re-elected once we've done it. And there's an awful lot of truth in that. Hmm. 
Adam Ferguson, author of When Money Dies, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Thank you, James.